and hard rock. The point of it all is, <laughs> the evidence is really lining up in our favor. There's every reason in the world for us to adopt the creationist flood mindset and no reason to hold on to the, the evolutionary slow and gradual process concept. Later, later in the flood, the mountains would have come up and, and it would have probably taken several hundred years for the earth to settle back down into an equilibrium position. It is true that Noah got off the ark about a year after he got on. Now, I'm not disputing that. But evidently, when he got off, the ground at the base of Mount Ararat was finally dry enough to support life. It doesn't say anything at all about Arizona. It just says about the base of Mount Ararat. But um, if we define the flood as a geologic event, as the length of time between Genesis 7:11, when all the fountains of the great deep broke open, the windows of heaven were open, when the earth, that beautiful pre-flood environment just cracked, just was destroyed, until the time it finally settled back down into a relative equilibrium like we find it today, it was probably on the order of several hundred, maybe a thousand years. And during that time of readjustment, well, you know, until the the, the ocean currents got established until the jet streams were established and until the, the ground began to revegetate and until it all began to, to come back together again, it was probably a pretty awful world in which to live. I'm sure Noah, for the 300 or so years he lived after the flood, was in constant, um, I mean, there were just constant earthquakes and volcanoes and just was a mess. But one of the predictions I think we can make is that there would have been an ice age following Noah's flood as a direct result of Noah's flood. In fact, it's, it's possible even to think of the ice age as the last gasp of Noah's flood. The ice age, of course, is a real problem to anybody that's ever stopped to try to, to think it through. Everybody's got ideas on, on how the ice age may have formed, and many possible scenarios have been proposed, such as dropping the temperature on a global scale and maybe the sun lost some of its intensity for a while and just a variety of things volcanism putting dust in the atmosphere which would shield the earth from solar radiation all those sorts of things have been proposed and they've all been shot down they're easy to shoot down because well within the uniformitarian mindset you just can't change things enough to result in an ice age the ice age takes some very dramatic conditions First of all, you've got to have more evaporation, which would produce more snowfall. So what is it that would kick off more evaporation to be the, the raw material for the snow? And then once you get the snow, you've got to keep it from melting in the next summer. Well, even though the uniformitarian can't do it, I'm convinced that the flood model really provides the key for understanding the ice age. In fact, I'm convinced that the flood would have produced an ice age. One of the reasons is that as that flood ended, I suspect that the oceans were probably warmer, and warmer oceans would have produced more evaporation. The oceans were probably warmer because as that flood ended, well, before the flood, the waters were probably warmer. We see that as evidenced in the, in the um, geologic deposits, like the coral deposits and the coal, and it looks like the whole world was a warmer, more more tropical or subtropical sort of place to live. And so the oceans would have been warmer before the flood. During the flood, all these fountains of the deep came up and, and as the continents were uplifted, there was a lot of friction and, and a lot of sources of heat during the flood so that if Noah, when he got off the ark, if he'd gone out and put a thermometer in the ocean, it probably would have read several degrees hotter than now, maybe 10, 15 degrees hotter than now. That's an incredible amount of heat. To heat the oceans 10, 15, 20 degrees, the uniformitarian cannot comprehend that sort of a change. But I think that's exactly what the flood would insist on. If the oceans were hotter, then they would be kicking up vast amounts of water into the atmosphere in the form of evaporation. That evaporation then would have fallen on the, on the land surface, particularly when we notice that while the oceans were hot, the continents were probably very cold because, well, there was nothing growing there. There was just a mud slick by and large. So there'd be more snowfall. And then the summer times after the flood would probably be colder so that the, um, the snow that fell in the winter wouldn't evaporate. That's due to the fact that later in, later in the flood, as the continents were being uplifted, there was a lot of volcanism, a lot of volcanic dust out in the atmosphere, shielding it from the solar radiation. The land was barren and, and well, 
you'd have a colder summer, less snow melt in the summer, you'd have more evaporation, more snowfall, less snow melt. That's exactly the requirement for the ice age to occur. And I, I suspect that uh, this is easily the best model for the ice ages on the market. Nobody else even comes close to modeling the, the ice age as do the creationists. This would continue until the oceans finally gave up their excess heat and the atmosphere cleared of all the volcanic dust that was out there. The flood makes sense out of an awful lot of data. The flood, I'm convinced, is a bottom line issue. The Bible tells us that in the latter days there will be those who will deny the, the flood. In the last days they'll come scoffers, Peter says, walking after their own lust, denying the promise of his coming and holding as their creed, it says there, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. That's a statement of the concept of uniformity, that, that the present is the key to the past. That's what Peter is saying. They'll come in these last days, folks that advocate that the present is the key to the past, that all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation, that present processes are responsible for the, for the, for the organization of things, even from the start, way back at the beginning. The Bible says they're willingly ignorant. They're willingly ignorant that by the word of God, the heavens were the, of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. That's a reference back to the original created state of things in Genesis 1.1. And they are willingly ignorant, verse 6, that the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. I'm convinced that the flood is really the bottom line issue. If Noah's flood happened, then it laid down the rocks and the fossils. And if it laid down those rocks and the fossils, then the evolutionist who uses those rocks and fossils as evidence for evolution and an old earth is wrong. He has denied truth and the conclusions, the interpretations he's come to are wrong. But if the flood happened, it laid down those rocks and the fossils and there is no evidence for evolution. There is no evidence that the earth is old. Noah's flood, the bottom line issue. You may be interested to know that over 30 years ago, the book The Genesis Flood was really the catalyst that started the modern creation movement. The two authors, Dr. John Whitcomb and Dr. Henry Morris, knew that the nature of the flood was the most fundamental issue in resolving the creation-evolution controversy. This still is a most complete geologic study on the effects of Noah's flood. The importance of the flood is one of the reasons that so many of our ICR books deal with this subject in one form or another. For example, let me just briefly mention uh, this book, Science, Scripture, and the Young Earth, of which I was one of the co-authors. Another one entitled, What is Creation Science?, which has a good chapter on Noah's Flood. And another, a geologic source book, Catastrophes in Earth History, by Dr. Steve Austin. John, some of our children's books also deal with the flood, especially yours, Noah's Ark and the Lost World, and also Dr. Gish's book, The Amazing Story of Creation. You know, it's such a fundamental issue that each Christian needs to come to grips with the nature of the flood and its effects and so on, and to begin to train their children in this subject. These and other creation materials, including other programs in this Back to Genesis series, have been mightily used by God to answer questions, both biblical and scientific, to convince skeptics of the truth of creation, to train up children in the way they should go, to establish the importance of creation to the Christian faith. They can be ordered.